Have you ever been at a time in your life where you just feel that there is no hope, that all is lost, no matter what the circumstance might be, uh, there, there is something that happens where, that causes you to just say, wait a minute, it's all hopeless right now. This uh, happened to me, well, it didn't happen to me, but when I was about, I don't know, 14 or 15, I was in my early teens, it was before I got my license, I remember that. My parents went through this period where they separated. They were having some issues, marital problems. My father was battling addiction with alcohol. And at one point, my mother got to the point where she just, she knew what was right for her family, and they decided to separate for a couple of months. So my mom stayed in the house we grew up in, and uh, my grandmother actually lived only a half a block away. So for all you who have mother-in-law issues, imagine that. <laughs> and so my father stayed down there in a trail in a camper that we owned. But uh, uh, eventually, they worked it out and they got back together. My father decided that a life of drinking was not as important as a life with his family. I, I go here because a couple of years later, probably four or five or six years later, in fact, I might have been preparing to get married myself. I was talking to my mother about this time in her life and in our family's life. And, and she told me just that, that, that when that happened, when she had to make that decision, she thought and, 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 and felt that everything was lost. All the, the, the dreams she had, all the plans she had made, the family she had built, the home she lived, because she could have been homeless. You know, all of this stuff kind of entered her mind, and she just got to this point where there was really no hope. She couldn't figure out how to get back to the place where she was. Now, fortunately, it works out, because life is a little bit odd like that, where things work out sometimes. And that happened to me myself. Some of you may know that in a previous life, before I met Susie, I was married and, and divorced. And uh, although I know that was the decision God led me to, to pursue uh, for myself, for my family, for my children, I still went through that period of time where you work so hard for something. You build this life, and it's all gone. Things just seem hopeless and lost. And yet, things always seem to work out. I met the woman that I'm supposed to be with, the woman that God designed for me to be with, and we've been happy ever since. It's been almost 17 years now, and uh, praise God for that. Life is odd, has a way of working things out. And, and, and if you've been following us for the last three weeks, I go through this because if you've been following us for the last three weeks, you may be at that point right now. We've gone through this journey where we have told ourselves that we're, we're all suffering from the condition of sin. That no matter how hard we try, we can't do the right thing even if we wanted to. That this condition of sin does a couple of other things in our lives. It separates us from our Creator. We can't have that relationship because the condition of sin has corrupted our lives. And then we fight this battle every day, day in and day out. We're in this battlefield and we're powerless over the battle. We've been there over the last three weeks, and we might be sitting here thinking, well, is it all just hopeless? Is it all lost? I mean, what's next? But Christianity, like life, is a bit odd. Christianity has just enough twists and turns in it that make it plausible. I mean, if I were going to invent Christianity, I would probably make it a little bit more middle of the road, a little bit more mundane, a little bit harder to poke holes in, because if you've read scripture in any length, uh, you know, whether it's beginning to end or just a couple of chapters or just a couple of books, you realize soon that things just don't make sense, and yet they make sense. Christianity is like that. It's a little bit odd. And, and, and God works in strange ways, too, because he gives us some things. If we ask the question, is it all lost, God puts some things in us that we don't even realize sometimes. For one, he puts in a conscience, right? He lets us know when we're doing wrong. We feel this kind of tap on the back of our head that, wait a minute, there's got to be something going on here because you don't feel right about this decision you're about to make. And then he gives us his word. He gave us this story of a people that he chose, the Jews, a people that he chose and for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, he trained them to follow him as the one and only true God, because that was something not heard of back in that day. You could pretty much pick any God you wanted, and if you couldn't explain something, you would just invent a God, and you would worship it. 
And he trained them over, over, and over, and over again. And sometimes it wasn't pretty, but he trained the Jews that I am your God and you are my people. And then from the Jews came this man we call Jesus. And Jesus is really the focus this week. The question, why is Jesus the only one qualified to help us with our condition? And speaking of odd, Jesus came on this earth and made some pretty outrageous claims. I mean, he said some pretty outrageous things. He said, I've come to judge the world. He said, I have always existed. And then he made this claim and he said, and I am God, one with the Father. Now, in the old system where you had gods for everything, that might not have been a big deal. And in fact, in some religious systems today, like pantheism, where everything is God, it may not be a big deal for something, somebody to say, I'm God, or that's God, or you're God. That might not be a big deal. But the Jews had just spent all this time being trained that there is only one God. God wasn't the world. He created the world. He was over and above the world. So for this man, Jesus, to claim he was one with the Father was a pretty outrageous claim. And then he made the most outrageous claim of all, he forgave people's sins. Right there, on the spot, he forgave people's sins. Could you imagine that? We've heard that so often in the course of Christianity and in the course of things that we learn that sometimes it just blows right by us. How can someone forgive someone else's sin when they're not even involved? I mean, if I have a beef with Shane, and, and, and I have offended Shane, Shane certainly has the right to forgive me. Shane was the offended party, and he has the right to forgive me. Or if I have a disagreement with Bill, and, and he offends me, I have the right to forgive Bill. But for somebody to come in third party and say, you know what, guys, I forgive you both. That's a pretty outrageous claim. And he did that. Before the cross, before the resurrection, Jesus came on this earth, and he told people, your sins are forgiven. It only makes sense if the person forgiving the sins is actually the person who was wounded by the sin. Only if that person was truly, in fact, God. Now, this is about the point of the story where some people might say, yeah, I've read your New Testament. I've read all those stories about Jesus and walking around on the earth. And, and I'm ready to accept that Jesus was a really great moral teacher. He was. But I'm not buying this God stuff. The problem with that is, if a man, if me or Shane or Paul or any one of us in this room came on the scene and started saying things like, I am one with the Father, I am God, your sins are forgiven, I came to judge the world, I've always existed, we wouldn't be a great moral teacher because isn't the mark of a great moral teacher, number one, humility? If a man said that, they wouldn't be a great moral teacher. They'd be a lunatic. We have a choice here. We can accept or reject. We can reject the, that Jesus was, in fact, God, and we can go on about our business, or we can accept that he was, in fact, God, and we can fall at his feet and worship him. But Jesus didn't leave the option open. He didn't leave the option that I'm just a great moral teacher open because his stuff was so outrageous and so outlandish that there was only one possible conclusion, that he was, in fact, God. And his power and his ability to do anything with our condition, to do anything in helping us with our condition of pride and sin and this battle that we face and our relationship with God the Father, that all rests solely on our choice, whether we believe that Jesus was God or was not. We have to choose one or the other. And, and if we choose one, we have hope. We have a guarantee. We have all of the stuff that's promised to us in, in God's word. And if we choose the other one, we're just kind of stuck. We're just stuck. The gospel writer John, his whole purpose in writing his gospel um, it is to proclaim the deity, that Jesus Christ is, in fact, God. That he came on this earth, he was God, and he starts his gospel this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And the Word became flesh as Jesus. 
and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This was a man who was side by side with Jesus on this earth, eyewitness to all the stuff that Jesus did. In fact, if you read his gospel, he never refers to himself as John. He refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved or the beloved disciple. That's kind of how tight they were, him and Jesus. So, so he had seen these things. He had seen the miracles and the wonders and the signs that all pointed to this fact that Jesus was, in fact, God. We can't move on. We're stuck at this point unless we choose a path because the claims of Christianity and our uh, relationship with God and the eternal fate of our soul and, and all of that stuff we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, fixing that stuff all hinge on this one thing. John said that. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, believes everything about him, not that he was a great moral teacher, believes that he was God, believes that he died on the cross, that he rose again, who believes all that stuff wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. Now, if Jesus is God and we believe that he is, why did he have to come to earth? Why was that even a thing that was necessary? I mean, what was the purpose of that? And, and this is where there really is a big difference between our view of Jesus. Because if we view Jesus as a great moral teacher and nothing more, and we read the New Testament at, with that lens, if we read the New Testament with that lens, then we see this. We see a man who walked around the earth for 33 plus or minus years. Uh, he, he taught some stuff. We now have some sound bites that we can take from this guy, like love your neighbor and uh, do unto others as you want them to do to you, and blessed are the meek and blessed are the humble and all those things. We have some great sound bites. And, and he taught us some good lessons, and then he ticked some people off, and then he died, and that was the end of the story. But, but when we do that, we blow right by the good stuff. See, if we read Scripture with the lens of Jesus is God, then we see something totally different because all throughout the New Testament, they're talking about this one thing, this one amazing thing, and that is Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. That is the point. And if we don't think of Jesus as God, then we blow right by that as just, oh, he was here, now he's gone, end of story. It's no longer this yeah, right moment. It has a meaning. It does mean something. And we miss sometimes the weight of that one act in Jesus' death. When he gave himself up on the cross, he rectified our condition of sin. He took it all upon himself. He rectified it. He reversed our spiritual death so that we could once again have this relationship with God the Father the way it was intended. And one of the arguments against this is why in the world would a good God punish an innocent man? Why would a good God do that? And if we think about the whole death and resurrection as punishment, that's a sensible question to ask. But if we think about it a little bit differently, then it seems to make a little bit more sense. Suppose, for instance, that I get into some financial trouble. Whatever the cause may be, I've lost my job, I lost big at the track, I don't know what else could be, but I've, lo I've, I've gotten into some financial trouble and I can't pay my bills and I end up in this situation where I'm robbing Peter to pay Paul and robbing Paul to pay Peter and my debt just keeps going higher and higher and higher and I get in a deeper and deeper and deeper hole until I'm just buried underwater. Now there is no possible way that I can ever come up with enough money to get myself out of that debt. I've tried and just dug myself deeper into a hole. But my rich Uncle John... He might be able to help me. My rich Aunt Martha, she might be able to help me get out of my debt. And you see, if we think about Jesus' act on the cross as payment for our debt, this hole that we're in caused by our condition of sin, it all seems to make sense how an innocent person can come and stand in our place to pay our debt. It makes sense. And then there's the resurrection. And this wasn't a myth. The Apostle Paul said, 500 plus people have seen this and some of them are still alive. In other words, go ask them yourself. Bodily and physically, he was raised from the dead and walked around this earth. He talked to his disciples. 
He talked to other people. He was there. But when he was raised to new life, we also got to be raised to new life. You see, his resurrection enables us to have that new life that God wants us to have. In us is now a part of Jesus' act of death and rising again so that we may rise to new life. We're no longer ever ruled by our condition of sin. Jesus has paid that debt and we have been raised to a new person. Forgiveness and restoration and new life, all that stuff is absolutely free. Absolutely free. God's grace makes it free to us if we just believe. And God's grace is also what pulls us along till we get to that point. God's grace. It's all free. These things that we've been talking about, the fact that we were born to fail, and the fact that we were born to seek, and the fact that we were born to fight, those are all things that we have by circumstance. We kind of inherited those things through no doing of our own. But the fact that we were born to live, that is by design. That is the way God designed it from the very beginning when he created the world and created Adam and Eve. We were designed to live with him. He loves us and we love him. That's the way it was designed to be, free from the bondage of sin and in this relationship, this loving, caring relationship with God. It's all free through Jesus' one act on the cross. But here's the catch, and this is where it gets good. You see, this fight that we are in every day, this, this battlefield that surrounds us that we talked about last week, all of that just doesn't stop and go away the moment we believe. It just doesn't cease to exist. Yes, we have new life, but no, it's not like somebody snaps their fingers and all of our old stuff goes away. Jesus tells us that we have to repent. And that's one of those words that people don't like. It's right up there with sin. Repent. Because it means that we have to go in a different direction. We have to give up the things that we were so used to doing. We have to turn. We have to lay down our arms. We have to unlearn all the pride and all the self-will that we have been plagued with for so long. It's hard. We have to kill off a part of ourselves that we love so much. We have to repent. But here's the paradox. Only someone who is afflicted with the condition of sin needs to repent. But only a good person can actually repent perfectly. And only a perfect person can repent perfectly. However, a perfect person wouldn't need to repent, would they? It's kind of a sticky situation. The same condition of sin that makes us need repentance is also the same thing that keeps us from really doing it full bore with everything we have. But God can help us. When we take part in Jesus' death and resurrection, he puts a little bit of himself in us. We share in Jesus' death so that, so that we have a little bit of God in us to help us along that path. We, we, we have been repented for by God himself. He puts that in us. He enables us to do that. But here's the catch. What if I told you that God, in his own nature, is unable to repent? We have to think about this. Remember, only a person afflicted with the condition of sin needs to repent. God has never been there. God is perfect. God would have no need for repentance, and God can do all the things that are in God's nature, but God cannot do anything that is outside of his nature. This is why there is no such thing as an evil God. There is no such thing as a hateful God. There is no such thing as a vengeful or spiteful God. There is a loving God because that is God's nature. Sin is not in his nature, so he doesn't need to repent. He can't surrender his will. He can't suffer. He can't submit. He can't die to his old self. He can't do that. But what if God became man? What if God became man and our human ability to submit and to suffer and die to our old self was all mashed up with God's perfection? Then 
he can surrender his will and die and suffer because he is human. But he can do it perfectly for us because he is also God. Our repentance, our ability to die to our old self is only possible if God empowers us to do that, if he does it in us. And he can only do it by becoming a man. And this, this is why Christianity offers the only hope out of all the religious systems and self-help manuals and five-step programs, Christianity is the only one that offers true hope. And this, this is why Jesus Christ is the only one qualified to give us that hope. Jesus Christ, fully God and fully human. He is the only one who can do it. He's the only one who can satisfy our debt. He's the only one who can restore our relationship with God. The only one who can replace our thoughts with his thoughts. He is the only one who can fill us with love so that we can learn to love the world and love the people around us. He's the only one that can reverse our failures. He's the only one that can help us in the battlefield. He's the only one that can overcome our condition of sin and overcome the pride that leads us to do all the things. He's the only one that can help us with the temptations that Satan fills this world with. He's the only one, fully God, perfect in every way, capable of forgiving our sin, yet fully human so that he can submit his will and suffer and die in our place so that we can have new life. Now, we can do this all by ourselves. We can choose any one of these systems that don't offer the same hope, the same guarantee that Jesus Christ offers us. We can, we can concede to our inability to do the right thing. We can be content being separated from our Creator. We can live life in the battlefield, powerless in the battle. Or we can believe in the only one capable of saving us, Jesus Christ. And so what do we choose? Shane and Paul are going to come up. We're going to have a, a short time of reflection. And while we do that... <clears throat> I'd like us to ponder this question. Why did I, if you already believe in Jesus, why is it that I put my faith in him in the first place? And if you don't already believe in the saving power of Jesus Christ, if you're not at that place yet, um, then maybe that's the question you need to think about right now. Am I tired of doing this on my own? Am I ready to put my faith and hope and trust in the only one capable of saving me, the only one perfect enough to pay my debt, the only one perfect enough to stand in my place, and yet the only one fully human enough to be able to submit his will and die for us. asking you today, if you already have a relationship with Jesus Christ, would you recommit your life? Would you just em em embed in your heart and your soul that, that, that whatever your decision was based on before, that right now it's because Jesus is the only one who can satisfy our condition of sin? Would you do that? Would you recommit yourself today for that purpose? To be filled with his thoughts? to be filled with his love, 
to realize that he's the one who stood in our place. He's the one who is the king of our heart. I want to say what you're saying. Speaking life to what is there. Father, we are so grateful that through it all, even through our turning away from you and our uh, running in the opposite direction of you, that you provided a way. That you knew in the grand scheme of things, the only way for us to be satisfied to you was, was by sending a part of you down to this earth to be man so that he could submit his will to you. Father, we thank you for that. God, I pray that if there is anyone here today who does not have that relationship, who has not made that decision, who is just on the edge saying, I can't do this by myself anymore, that they would just step up and say, Jesus, I believe. I believe that you are God. I believe that you went to that cross and, and not only took my sin to it, but became my sin so that my sin was crushed and died forever. And then you rose again so that I could share your resurrection and have new life. God, I ask that if there's anyone who needs to make that decision, that they make it today. God, thank you for the, the people we have here. Thank you for leading this church. Thank you for being here with us and meeting us in this place today. We just ask that, we keep everyone, that you keep everyone safe until we return again. And we pray all this in the only one possible to offer that hope, Jesus Christ. Together we all say, Amen.